Hello and welcome to everyone out there in the actual tech media audience. Thank you so much for joining us on the webinar today. We've got a great event lined up for you and this is a really timely event. I know many of you are going to be really interested uh, in today's uh, presentation. The topic is 2023 cloud technology trends, simplifying multi-cloud complexity with an evolved cloud approach. This event is presented in partnership with our friends from NetApp. Before we get started, there's just a few things that you should know about the event today. Starting off with, uh, I should introduce myself. My name is David Davis of Actual Tech Media, and I'll be serving as the host. Uh, we always want these events to be educational. Uh, we're all former IT professionals here ourselves at Actual Tech Media. Uh, we know how tough it can be out there in the world of enterprise technology, and we wanna help you to solve your challenges on events just like this. So. We encourage your questions. I see many of you have already said uh, hello and good afternoon there in the questions pane, uh, but we also want your technical questions on today's topic. So keep those questions coming. And we even have a best question prize to help further encourage some questions. I'll talk about that here in just a moment. Uh, but first I wanna call your attention there to the handouts tab. There's a number of excellent resources in the handouts tab, uh, three different resources starting off with uh, a cool infographic on uh, multi-cloud doesn't have to be multi-complicated. Make sure that you download that. Lots of great statistics on that as well. Then there's an ebook on NetApp's guide to the future of cloud. You wanna make sure that you check that out. That's a really well done, uh, really visually appealing guide. And then uh, finally, the last one there is the um, cyber resilience ebook on protecting your data from the inside out. So just click on those three links. Those will download the PDF resources locally to your computer, and you can check them out after the event, share them with your friends and colleagues. And then last year on the list is our Amazon $300 gift card. At the end of the webinar, I'll be announcing the winner of that prize. If you're watching this uh, recorded after the fact, of course, the drawing has already occurred. The prize terms and conditions can be found right there in the handouts tab of your audience console. And then, as I mentioned, we also have a Amazon $50 gift card for our best question prize today. Uh, that means you have to ask a question to be entered into that prize drawing and meet the prize terms and conditions. We'll select that prize winner uh, when we get to review all the questions after the event, and we'll contact you then. All right, with that housekeeping information out of the way, it's now time to bring in today's expert presenter. I'm excited to welcome Mr. Matt Watts, Chief Technology Evangelist at NetApp. Matt, it's great to have you on. Thanks for being here. It's great to be here. I'm really looking forward to speaking to this group. Absolutely, yeah. Well, before I turn it over to you, Matt, uh, I have a poll for everyone out there in the audience. We wanna call your attention to the question there in the slides window. It says, where are you in your cloud journey? Um, are you currently using private cloud or on-premises clouds, uh, cloud of some kind, uh, public cloud? Do you have a hybrid cloud design or perhaps a hybrid multi-cloud design? Uh, select the best answer that corresponds to you and your company, and I'll share the results here in just a moment. I know it takes a moment to, uh, for this poll to come up sometimes, so I'll give everyone a moment to respond to this. Um, we know that cloud is a journey. It's not something you do overnight. And so we wanna find out where you are in that journey. So lots of good responses coming in. Thank you for those. Let me go ahead and share the results now. And it looks like 37%, uh, uh, that was the top response there doing hybrid cloud, followed by 29% private cloud slash on-premises and closely followed by hybrid multi-cloud at 25%. Uh, Matt, what do you think? I, to be honest, I thought the hybrid multi-cloud might be higher than that. I think um, from a lot of the research that we've done, a lot of companies that I've been meeting with, it, it's 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 pretty high on uh, for most of those kind of organizations. But um, yeah, I think it's um, generally the kind of 70% number being public hybrid or hybrid multi, that kind of feels about right. Excellent. All right. We'll take it away, Matt. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, great. So let me let me get straight into this. And um, 
thank you all for taking the time to join us. It, I know this, your time is very precious and, uh, and, it, and it's, it's really appreciated by all of us. Um, I want to talk about um, kind of some of the trends that we're seeing. Um, and, and I want to start off with, a, I guess, a little bit sort of looking backwards in terms of looking forward. Um, I've been in the industry, and maybe I won't share exactly how many years I've been in the industry, but the beard wasn't grey when I when I first sort of came into IT. So that'll give you a sense for it. Um, but the reality is, was I think, you know, I joined the IT industry in what I call the first wave. And I think we've been through kind of three major waves in IT. And the first wave for me was really about bare metal infrastructure. It was about physical technology. You know, I joined NetApp as a, the storage company, and I was very focused on bits and bytes and speeds and feeds. And, you know, it was a very technical product focused kind of industry. And that, it doesn't go away. It's just that what happens over time is we see a new wave start to form and people's attention tends to be drawn towards it because it's perceived and often is the case that this new wave has great new value, new possibilities that it can offer. And I think the second wave, without a doubt for me, would be characterized by virtualization. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how many of you on this call, you know, remember that there, there was a world before virtualization and actually it wasn't that long ago, um, but it fundamentally changed the IT landscape. Um, and for those of you who were there at that time, you know, that was a, a, a massive shift from the way that we designed and built and architected environments to this new virtual world and the way that we operated in that world. Um, it was disruptive, it was innovative, it required us all to, to change and to adapt and to look at kind of new ways of doing things. And that wave, again, carries on. I don't see virtualization disappearing anytime soon, but we are without a shadow of a doubt in what I class as the third wave. And 70% of you um, from, from the number 71% are, are kind of indicating that that's the case as well, which is really cloud native or using some form of kind of public cloud in some way, shape or form. Um, and there's lots and lots of different terms, you know, public cloud, private cloud, hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, all these different kind of cases. Um, and I think this one continues to be challenging. I think people recognize the opportunities are there, but along with the opportunities that the cloud is offering to us, there are some new challenges that we're going to have to deal with. Um, but uh, but very much, I kind of see that, that we've been in these, these three waves. I'm sure somebody will ask a question of, you know, what's the fourth wave? Uh, you know, I wish I had the crystal ball because if I could tell you exactly what I think the fourth wave is going to be, um, I could probably be a very rich person and that, that certainly isn't the case. Um, but there's a lot of indications of things that I think will influence the fourth wave. Technologies like, um, um, you know, sort of, I guess, hybrid, not hybrid computing, sort of quantum computing, things like that. But that, that's, I digress away from what we're due to talk about today. But here's the indication, here's the kind of key thing. If I go back to sort of when we were talking about this in 2019, I think maybe we, as an industry, sort of over pivoted and kind of almost said the cloud will be everything. And that, um, you know, that, you know, most companies will close their data centers. It's the end of data centers. Um, and now I think what we're seeing is the reality of that is that a lot of these things don't go away. In 2022, you know, 54% of companies say they still rely on on-premises data centers. So for those of you who work with on-premises technology, you, you know, you, you, your job isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Um, but it is definitely a balance. And again, I think that sort of played out in the questions that um, and the answers that you gave earlier on. For, even for on-premises though, if we start to think about trends that are being influenced by, by a lot by the cloud. Um, and I'm going to touch on, on each one of these. Um, I think simplicity, you know, we need to continue to focus on how do we ensure that, you know, the clouds don't introduce more complexity. You know, every cloud for the, the people who work in those clouds, every cloud, you know, the people who operate them would say they're quite simple, but they're all different. So we've got to start thinking about how do we blend the on-premises platforms that we use 
multiples of them with lots of different clouds that we're potentially going to use as well. We've got to think about security. Um, I'm doing a video at the moment and we're calling it gone in 39 seconds rather than gone in 60 seconds because there is a successful ransomware attack now every 39 seconds. Um, so security is becoming because of the nature of the world we live in something that we have to put more and more and more focus onto. Um, and now that we're opening our environments up to SaaS platforms, to multiple clouds, we need to think about security in a much broader spectrum as well, because we're increasing the number of kind of attack surfaces. There was a perception right at the very beginning that cloud would be cheap um, and that we would all save money going to the cloud. And I think we're now starting to realize that the cloud is not always about cost savings. Um, the cloud is about innovation. And at times you'll pay more for innovation. Um, so as those costs are starting to increase in the cloud, people are realizing that savings are needing to, to, to be addressed. And then finally, sustainability. And, and that one I will come back to you because I've got some numbers I'd like to share with you because um, this is a rabbit hole I went down uh, a couple of years ago now. Um, and the digital waste that we are creating and the impact of that in terms of the emissions that it's creating is horrific. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit more about that, as it, especially as it relates to the cloud. So the reality today, and this was where I was interested that when you sort of when we looked at the numbers, that um, you know we, the cloud has been this interesting journey. In the beginning, it was amazing how many companies I would meet with, and I would ask them, you know, what's your cloud strategy, and they would say, you know, cloud first. I'd say, well, that's not really a strategy. That that's more of a kind of a mandate. So what's your strategy to go cloud first? And they would say, you know, Amazon or Google. I'd say, well, again, that's not really a strategy. That's a destination. So most people's cloud strategies in the early days were driven by these kind of corporate mandates, which was we're going to this cloud and that's the first thing we'll do. And it's going to be on this particular cloud provider. We very quickly realized the error of our ways. Um, and I think cloud first kind of as an exclamation, as a, as a mandate, changed into cloud first as a question to be asked. And I think that was really sensible. You know, it's, it's something we should ask, should we do this cloud first? Does it make sense to do this cloud first? So there's definitely been a maturity that's happening there. And now what we're starting to see is that as companies have had that mostly positive experience with their first cloud, they now want that kind of freedom to say, well, actually, we want to give our staff, we want to give our developers, we want to give our innovators the ability to work in the cloud that they want to work in. Different clouds have different values for different people. You know, some people will look at Google Cloud Platform and say, actually, that's where we want to go and do AI. Or others will look at Amazon and say, this is where the developers want to work. So there's this acknowledgement that there's, there's a need to have kind of freedom and to be able to work across multiple clouds. And we're definitely starting to see that reflected in the numbers of people that are that are adopting these kind of multi-cloud approaches. So I want to throw this up and, and, and I might, I've sort of jest a little bit with this and I wonder how many people will actually get um, a, a line or shout house or bingo at some point through this call. There's an, it's interesting to see how thing, where things have come from and where they've got to. We talked about public cloud and private cloud and hybrid cloud and multi-cloud and then hybrid multi-cloud came along. And now we're starting to see an evolution. We're starting to see terms like meta cloud, super cloud, hyper cloud. Yeah, you can um, you can certainly pay the marketeers to come up with this stuff, and uh, and there's no no shortage of uh, of innovation and and creativity. Um, but behind all of this is a reality. So forget the names. You're going to hear so many new ways of talking about cloud. All these new terms. But when you kind of put the terms to one side, and it's interesting to look at, but what's caused that to happen? For us all as vendors and analysts and everyone else to come up with these terms means that we've all picked up on something. So forget the terms and look at what have we picked up on? What is kind of causing this? So David, let me throw that back to you for, uh, for our second polling question, if I could. Absolutely, yeah. I love the idea of cloud bingo there. 
Um, there are a lot of different cloud terms. <laughs> and in fact, the poll question here is, what are your top challenges in managing multi-cloud? Uh, check more than one if app applicable. So, uh, you know, data and application silos, maybe you're challenged by that. Maybe rapidly a growing cloud sprawl. It sure is easy to bring up new instances and move data into the cloud, but not always, you know, easy to, to manage it and, and monitor it. Um, cybersecurity risk, uh, concerns about security in the cloud, cost control, uh, maybe just lack of, of skills to uh, manage and administer and monitor the cloud. Or, or perhaps uh, sustainability and energy efficiency uh, challenges. So I see lots of good votes already coming in. Thank you for those. I will share the results of this poll here in just a moment. I don't wanna uh, taint the results by mentioning or hinting at any of the uh, early results as they come in, but uh, let's go ahead and share the results now. And it looks like 61% are concerned about security. That is the greatest concern, followed by 50% with lack of skills around cloud. Uh, what's your take, Matt? Yeah, so I think that, um, that kind of backs up a lot of what we're seeing and, uh, and, and kind of leads me perfectly into kind of what I wanted to, to, to sort of share. But, you know, what, do, what are the, the cloud trends that we're seeing? And they are shaped by all of these things. So let me give you a let me give you a picture to, to kind of think about. Um, I don't know. I can't see you. I don't know people's ages on this call, how long you've been in the IT industry. So but let me assume that you were here before virtualization happened. Right. So if you were, then this will mean something to you. If you weren't, I'll give you another an analogy in a second. If you think back to why did virtualization happen? Right. The reason virtualization fundamentally happened was that we'd spent years, decades even, building technology platforms that were the best platforms to run particular applications. And the more platforms that we adopted, the more applications that we embraced as organizations, the more of these platforms that we built. And over time, we ended up with this huge collection of what are individually the best applications, the best stacks to support applications, but we ended up with lots and lots and lots of them. And that's what kind of VMware solved for. VMware recognized that this sprawl, this kind of isolation, this siloed nature was causing challenges. And, and that's where, you know, if you could create this virtual layer, you could address an awful lot of the problems that, that had been kind of built up over time. And there's a lot of parallels with what we're seeing now as companies are looking at multiple clouds. Every cloud on its own is, I don't wanna say simple, that's not, that's not a fair statement, but every cloud has its own way of operating, um, but they're all different. And as people start to look at their first cloud and then their second cloud, third cloud, fourth cloud, a lot of the problems that we previously solved are starting to come back. And not just problems that we'd solved, it's bringing new problems with it as well. And that was why it was so interesting to see some of the comments that we got. There's a lot of complexity coming back in. How do you deal with multiple vendor consoles, logins, billing? Um, how do you deal with different disparate data management tools? You know, every, the way you store, manage, protect, deal with data is different across every cloud. How do you make sure that data is not locked into silos, that you kind of have that freedom that people working in different clouds can be able to deal with it. How do you deal with security methods? So, so many of these, I think, are really picked up in exactly what, what the audience was looking at. Um, there's a growing skills shortage. And that is so true that depending on who you are, the company that you work for, cloud skills are in demand there are just generally a lack of people in the market that have good, strong cloud skills. And as companies develop the people to have those skills, unfortunately, those people often become valuable and often look for other opportunities, other roles. So we're, we're tapping into a limited skill set. And I'll talk about what that means in a second, but the final point is this idea of ballooning cloud costs. Um, most people, most organizations are spending a lot more money in the cloud than they should be, whether they know it or not. 
most companies are spending significantly more than they actually should be for a number of different reasons. So going back to this whole meta cloud, super cloud, hyper cloud, what is that all about? It's to solve for this. This evolution of cloud, this kind of trend that we're starting to see a lot of tech vendors really starting to move towards is being driven because of this problem. We need to not only solve again for a lot of these problems that have come back to us, but we now need to solve for a lot of the new ones as well. And we don't solve it the same way. Nobody wants a, a walled garden that, that limits what they can do across clouds because that somehow helps with standardization. So the solution is different. And what that means is that companies are starting to look for these, kind of, I, I'm gonna call it layers of consistency. You know, how do we start layering across um, some, some consistent types of services such that the skills that we do develop with our own people, we can focus them on innovation, we can focus them on the applications, the application development, the innovation, and we can have these kind of layers of consistency across the clouds that take away from the stuff that, that, that you know, requires management and, you know, is a lot of the stuff that's, that's kind of overhead rather than in innovation. And for us as a company, and this is the only kind of plug that I'm gonna do because I want you to be thinking more about the problem that we've got and that it's about looking for these layers of standardization. You know, our approach to it is that we wanna say, if we can create that layer of standardized storage services, if you can have one way of storing, protecting, managing, encrypting, tiering, optimizing data, across every cloud for any application, that's something you'd have to be less concerned about now. That's something where, you know, that becomes one way of doing it. It addresses the skills shortages. It addresses the, the data silos, the simplicity of management. If you can have one way of providing cost optimization across multiple clouds, suddenly these problems that we know are there, how do we deal with security? Well, if you can be consistent in the way that you store, manage, protect, encrypt data, it goes part of the way to helping you address security. It does address simplicity. Let's have people using those skills that they do have to focus on innovation around the application layer rather than maintaining the storage or optimizing the compute layers. And that generates savings. For us, and I'll use this as a good example, NetApp is, we do a lot of development. A lot of our development work is done in Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. No surprise if you know NetApp because they're huge partners of us and we also run our services natively within those, the hyperscale providers. We bought a company called Spot two or three years ago now, which are focused on cost optimization in the cloud. And we bought them because we started using the product. And they made promises to us before we bought them, they'd made promises of savings to us. And it was kind of too good to be true. So we thought, well, we'll try it out. When we brought Spot into NetApp and started using it to align the most appropriate compute behind the applications that the developers were bringing online, it reduced our cloud compute spend by 73%. That is not unusual in the cloud world. So massive opportunities for savings. And the topic of sustainability, I'm, I'm hoping, because I saw on the, the, the poll, it was only about 4% of, of companies, of the people that answered the poll said it was sort of one of the important things to them. In which case, I'm hoping that we're bringing you something that is going to impact you significantly in the future and we're the first person to really make you aware of it. It's different in different regions. In the EMEA region, um, we're now starting to see governments stepping behind net zero targets, which means if you are a company operating in that region, you have to have sustainability plans. You have to have net zero goals in order to do business. Um, the UK government, the procurement arm of the UK government over the next year or two years will not do business with you unless you have a sustainability plan, you have aggressive sustainability targets as an organization and a 
demonstrable net zero goal for the future. We're seeing the same in France, in Germany, Spain, Italy. We're now starting to see it significantly coming through in the Asia Pacific region. And it's coming to America. And I think it's coming to America for all of those reasons. You know, companies like Apple and major companies are setting aggressive net zero goals. And when they commit to that, that also means that for them to achieve that, their supply chain has to as well. Capital ventures or capital markets, access to capital markets is now being linked and tied to the sustainability objectives, the sustainability credentials you have as an organization. So going forward, we're going to see governments putting more focus onto this and starting to, to, to encourage carrot and stick companies to become more sustainable. We're going to see it happen through the supply chain as some of these big organizations set aggressive sustainability goals. And we're going to see board level concerns because access to capital markets is already highly impacted by your level of sustainability as a company. So that's a really lofty kind of big, what the hell does that mean to me? I work in IT kind of question. So let me give you a sense of the problem and the opportunity. What does it mean to IT? In 2025, we will create 33 zettabytes of data across the world, which means if we look back at where we were in 2018, that means that over the next six, seven years, we will hit the Yottabyte problem by 2030. We will create globally a Yottabyte of data. I'm sure all of you know what a Yottabyte is, but just in case there's somebody on there that doesn't, a Yottabyte is 1,000 zettabytes. And if that doesn't help, that is 1 trillion terabytes. Let me make this really visual. 1 trillion terabytes is the equivalent of every single human being on the planet carrying around 500 iPhones full of data. That's how big the data challenge, the data growth is gonna be. But again, we, we think about that and think, well, who cares? Well, technology will solve the problem. Well, right now in the US, about 2% of your total electricity supply is currently feeding data centers. In the UK, it's about two and a half percent. And if we look out towards 2030, it is forecast that up to 8% of the global electricity supply will be feeding data centers. Now, again, you could look at that and say, well, that's maybe a worst case scenario. Well, let me bring this into stark reality. In Ireland, where we have a lot of the Amazon, Microsoft, Google, the enterprise hyperscale data centers, it's already 14%. 14% of a country's entire electricity supply is feeding data centers. But again, is that a problem? Well, let me give you some other numbers. Only 32% of the data we create is ever used again. 68% of the data we create is a gigantic landfill of garbage made up of cat videos, office parties, all sorts of stuff that we simply never ever use again. And storage is predicted to become up to 38% of the total data center power consumption by 2030. So let those numbers sink in. 8% of the world's electricity feeding data centers. 38% of that is storage. And two thirds of that storage will be storing data that we never ever use again. Running all of those numbers through means that one to two, even 3% of the world's electricity will be powering systems to store a landfill of garbage that we never ever use again after it's been created. We'll find some short term solutions. One of them will be cloud. We think about 49, 50% of data will be pushed across to the public cloud providers. The public cloud providers in many cases are either already net zero or are aggressively moving towards net zero. It's different for different ones. It's different for different ones in different regions. But in most cases, taking data out of 
data centers, traditional company data centers to the cloud is going to have a positive effect on admissions reductions. And all of that data frequently has compute associated with it as well. So when we take data, we take compute, and you then get the benefit from all of those things. So I'll leave you with a thought on sustainability, and then I'll, I'll, I'll just move on to, to what I, a couple of more things that I wanted to cover. If all the analogies and kind of metaphors that I've used really don't kind of land this for you, let me give you one that slapped me across the face when I saw it. Right now, the 68% of data that we currently create and never ever use again, the storage that that is sat on is currently creating more emissions than the entire airline industry. We create more emissions than the entire airline industry to store stuff we never ever use. And you think about it, you know, you look at your phone and how many photographs are on your phone? You know, how many, how many times you take a hundred photographs of the same thing and you keep all hundred of them, but actually it was only one of them was any good. It's lots of little things. We just, we just don't think about it because it's kind of the invisible, it's the invisible kind of um, horseman or almost, you know, every time you send an email that creates about half a gram of CO2 emissions. Fortunately, the stuff that we can do, once we realize it, once companies start to say, actually, a huge cloud trend for us, a huge trend for us in the future is going to be, how do we start to become more sustainable? Then you can start to look at, well, what are the approaches that we could take? NetApp are a storage data focused company that also do cloud optimization. And for us, it's definitely multifaceted. Get the foundations right. If you're storing data, make sure that whatever storage you're using is the most efficient storage you can use. Switch on all of the efficiency features wherever you can. Use efficient power supplies. Use QLC. You know, at that very, very foundational level, you know, invest in physical products that are as sustainable as kind of power sensitive as they can possibly be. But then you've got to start working up through the stack. You know, 68% of data we create is never used again after it's created. Let's find what that data is. Let's start doing more data analytics to identify it, to work out what could we do with it. I mean, heaven above, maybe we'll delete something at some point. I'm, I don't hold out too much hope because I've been in the IT industry for 25 years and I'm yet to find a company that's solved the who owns the data problem. Um, but I think at least if you can build a landscape of what your data looks like and start having different lenses that you can look through into that data and understanding the emissions that that data is creating, maybe we can take another run at the problem. Look across the whole infrastructure, you know, start to look for are there workloads that are consuming the most power? Are those candidates for the cloud? Um, look for, for kind of wastage across the infrastructure. And then when you do get to the cloud, this is the thing to be aware of. Behind the kind of the net zero stuff, and I'm sure some of you would have researched this, so you'll know, there's still a lot of moving the carbon around. There's a lot of renewable energy credits, a lot of carbon offsets where, you know, you can make yourselves look net zero because you sat on the national grid using fossil fuel created electricity, but you bought a bunch of renewable energy credits to there's nothing wrong with that. It's technically absolutely fine. But when you know that, it makes you realize that when you take workloads to the cloud, we still need to be thinking about how we optimizing the workloads when they get there. How are we making sure both from a cost perspective, but also from an emissions perspective that we're not wasting the cloud resources. And I hope a lot of this has been kind of useful to you. I hope some of this has been interesting to you. Um, this is my kind of last slide, which is really, which is of course a NetApp slide. This is our focus. We believe, truly believe that we are solving for the layers of consistency in this new multi-cloud world, the kinds of problems that were so significant that it enabled VMware to solve the problems of the past. We're not solving them the same way. You can't. Nobody wants a walled garden that takes away that freedom of choice of which cloud you operate in, which applications you're able to run inside the clouds. 
People want that freedom, that freedom to innovate. They want all of those things, but with layers of consistency, that means I've got one way to manage data, one way to deal with security, one way to deal with cost optimization. If I can do that, then that limited set of skills that we can develop or have access to, we can focus them on much, much less of the kind of the management and the day-to-day -day stuff and much, much more on the innovation stuff. So NetApp, that's our mission. We're a technology company. We provide solutions to store, manage, and protect organizations data in your own data centers and across the public clouds. And we provide cloud optimization and automation software to significantly reduce spending. Um, and our focus and the focus of these cloud trends that we're seeing is how do we help companies address savings, simplicity, security, and sustainability? So David, I think we've got one poll still to go. So let me pass back to you and, uh, and we'll get the next poll up on the screen. That's right, Matt. Yeah, the next poll is on the screen and our final poll, I should mention, the question is, what are your top cloud priorities in 2023? Uh, check more than one if applicable. And uh, the options there, you can see them uh, managing cloud migration, backup, disaster recovery, cloud operational performance, uh, optimizing investment, improving security, and transforming IT functions to the new cloud, hybrid cloud operating model, kind of back to that uh, training um, challenge that we talked about earlier. So we'll leave this up here for a moment. And now is the time to get in your questions. If you have a question for Matt and the NetApp team, uh, now is the time to ask because we are kicking off Q and A, and I kind of picked out some questions here that I think are more foundational, more broad. We'll start off with those. Um, Satyam is asking out there, what's the main difference between multi-cloud and hybrid cloud? So, so it's a really so I, the way I look at it, I think I see hybrid hybrid cloud as augmenting kind of on-premises technology with the resources of the cloud. So it sort of becomes part of a blended solution. So I think hybrid cloud for me sort of typically talks about, you know, backup, tiering, archive, um, disaster recovery, test and development. It's, I'm gonna keep workloads on premises, but I wanna use cloud resources to augment them to reduce cost, improve sustainability, you know, or to give me some additional capabilities. Multi-cloud for me is more, I want to be able to actually deploy, create, run, deploy applications across the clouds of my choice. You know, so I may have applications running in AWS, um, but I may also want to have applications running in a, another cloud. The interesting part of this is that what when does multi-cloud become hyper-cloud, super-cloud, the evolved cloud? Um, I think it's when people want that, almost that freedom to say, I want to be able to deploy wherever I want into whichever cloud I want, but I want to make sure that that doesn't increase complexity, compromise security, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, and that's why we have hybrid multi-cloud as a term as well, David, because it's, I think hybrid cloud is augmenting, multi-cloud is being able to work with multiples and hybrid multi-cloud is that kind of combination of all of them. It's why we're able to be so creative when we think about cloud bingo. <laughs> Excellent, I like it, yeah. Thank you for clarifying that point. I think that's a point of confusion for a number of folks out there, so that's important. Um, let me share the results now here of the poll, and it looks like 58% uh, said their uh, top goal was improving security, followed by 45% uh, managing cloud migration, backup, and disaster recovery. Um, thank you everyone for who responded there to the poll. I do want to now bring up this final slide here uh, with additional information. Uh, there's a link there. These are all hyperlinks. You can click on a uh, reach out to a NetApp representative for more information. You can scan the QR code there with your phone. And then the links there on the bottom right are all hyperlinks. So make sure that you check that out, including NetApp TV, uh, Matt Watts new series on NetApp TV. Uh, the second link there from the bottom, if you want to uh, learn more from Mr. Matt Watt here on the event today. So I'll leave that up, uh, check out the links and let's continue with some Q and A here. Uh, the next one here, Alan is asking, have you seen if there's a cloud that works better with another cloud 
than others, for example, AWS with Google Cloud versus AWS with Azure? Um, it, that's, a, it's, that's a pretty massive topic. I, I think it depends kind of in which way. Um, I, I think what we've seen is a kind of a recognition that they all kind of exist. Um, you know, I think there was a time where they all sort of, you know, it was our cloud or no one's cloud. And, you know, I think now there is this sort of general recognition in the industry that actually most companies are going to be um, in a more of a multi-cloud type environment. So there does seem to be more kind of acknowledgement and willingness to, 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 to have kind of applications and services that, that work across clouds. Um, I, I think the fact that, that, that NetApp have been able to provide some of these kind of layers of consistency. You know, if you think about our storage offering, you know, which is on tap, that runs as a native first party service in Amazon, Microsoft and Google, which, you know, if I go back six, seven years ago, would we have been able to deploy that kind of one consistent storage capability across all three clouds? Not convinced we, we could have done so. I think it's it's a topic for that we could really go into an, a much much deeper discussion. But I think we're definitely starting to see that kind of recognition of each other, and that the fact that the market is moving towards a much more multi cloud approach. Great point. Great point. Um, here's another interesting question. I'm not sure you might you might have mentioned attackers at some point uh, around security. Uh, they're asking what are the different types of attackers. I'm guessing in terms of uh, security for public and hybrid cloud environments? So, so it's, it's, it's multiple and, and we shouldn't always be thinking about people trying to get in from the outside. Um, mm. I, you know, I think we talk very frequently about kind of hackers and we talk about, you know, phishing attempts and all, and all of these sorts of things, you know, they're, they're definitely types of, of, of attempts. Um, but then we've also got to think very carefully about who has access to things internally. You know, some of the, the, the recent events that we've seen have been internal malicious, um, you know, disgruntled employee attacks who remove credentials or who prevent access to something. Um, so it, it's why the, the topic of security, I think, is becoming such a huge focus for everyone, because it's so multifaceted. You know, in the, in the olden days, it was secure the perimeter. You know, and if the perimeter is secure, you know, we've got a really good chance of, of not people not being able to break in. Now we don't have a perimeter now, or if we do, we have lots of perimeters. We've got the perimeters of, of multiple data centers, of cloud providers, of software as a service providers. Um, and so I, I think, I think the word attackers, I think it's still the right word. There's a lot of people that do it with kind of malicious intent. Um, but I think, or for um, gain or just for disruption. Um, but I, I think because it's become such such a, a broad thing, we need to be thinking about our own people, you know, zero trust access. We have to be starting to think about how do we lock down internal systems such that no one is trusted to have access. Um, so yeah, again, really big topic. So thank you for the question. It was Satyam, I think, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I think we could do a whole webinar just on that topic there. Um, another interesting question. They say, I have three types of data and different cloud providers. What are the main issues with different providers in terms of data security? So um, I'm, I'm, I would certainly don't want this to be seen as a criticism of any of them because it, it is not the steps that each cloud provider are taking around security are phenomenal you know some of the 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 kind of the autonomous with the the ais the some of the stuff that they're putting in place to look for and detect and identify different types of attacks is is phenomenal what i'm kind of saying is that certainly when we think about storage and data each one might be phenomenal but each one is fundamentally different so if you go into a cloud provider and say, we're going to use their native services, their native tools to manage the security of our data, then as you become multiple clouds, now you've got to do it two ways, three ways, four ways. And whilst each one, think about the, the VMware analogy, everyone might be the absolute best way of doing things, but now you've got two, three, four different ways of doing things. Do you have the skills? 
did you make sure all of them were secure? Did you do all the updates against them? Did you suddenly you've got something which is great, but it's really, really complex. And this is where this idea of kind of layers of consistency come back in. Is there a way that you could do that, which could give you kind of consistency across all of the clouds such that you're not building complexity? And with complexity comes opportunities to make a mistake, to get something wrong, to forget to do something that that kind of updates, you know? Absolutely. I, we don't need any more complexity in IT. Um, and I think that brings us no. to this other question, yeah, which is, um, what are the key elements or any kind of best practices you have to recommend around building a hybrid multi-cloud strategy? So I, I, I think it's, um, I think acknowledging it is the first one. Okay. Because certainly what I've seen is I call it, let's, let's have another cloud term. I should have put it on the bingo card. I call it accidental multi-cloud. I think because what we've seen happen um, is an awful lot of companies had no, never planned to be here, um, but somehow ended up here. So, you know, cloud was probably part of their strategy. A particular cloud provider was going to be the main part of the strategy. And then suddenly there's another one and another one. And no one really knows quite how it happened. And because of that, no one ever planned for it. So I think an awareness of the fact that you may you may absolutely think you are only ever going to be one cloud in my experience for most companies i talk to and it's it's a lot that was what they thought but then suddenly somebody started doing something in gcp and some other group had a requirement that could only be delivered by azure and so i think Acknowledge the fact that the chances are you are going to be hybrid multi-cloud if you aren't already and start working out what are those kind of layers of standardization that we want to put in place that are going to enable us to go in that direction and not just have this kind of exponential growth in complexity, a need for skills, costs, you know, all of the things that we just talked about. That, that would probably be my best advice. Acknowledge it, accept it and start building a plan for it. Yes, I think that's very wise advice. And I like that idea of accidental multi-cloud. Maybe they had a cloud first strategy, but they never said which cloud and now they're in all the clouds. No, <laughs> just kidding. Um, but um, here's another good one. Uh, the question is with limited IT resources, what do you see companies doing to optimize cloud spending? And that was one of the challenges that folks talked about as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's, and it, I mean, it's, it's one of the reasons why, you know, I know this is a gratuitous plug, but it's one of the reasons why NetApp bought Spot uh, as a company, because one, we came to this horrible rec realization that we were overspending in the cloud. Now, again, the cloud providers individually are actually starting to offer some good tools within their cloud as to Sorry, I think my camera froze then for a second. So let me start again. Each kind of cloud provider in their cloud is now starting to offer some quite good tools to help with kind of cost optimization or to at least help you identify where your spend is going and how much maybe you're overspending. But it's back to that same problem again of, you know, each vendor, each cloud provider will do that for their cloud. Some will do it with varying levels of kind of automation at the back end to say, not only will we identify it and tell you, we'll help you do something about it. So the, the tools are kind of inconsistent in terms of the clouds they operate across and in terms of the, the scope of what they can do. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a big issue. And I think, you know, it's why technologies such as our spot where it's automatic. You put spot in, and, and here's the key thing, and, and the sales guys are gonna love me for telling you this, but I will. Um, we don't charge, we, we, the way we charge for spot is we charge a percentage of what you save. So we put spot in, and if we don't save you money, we don't get paid on it. And it's one consistent tool that runs across all of the cloud providers. So I think look for layers of consistency, look for tooling that can help you, and then look for those kind of procurement models where it's not up to you to save the money. 
because we've how many times have we been through this before where it's you give me an awful lot of money for my technology and i promise you that at some point we might see some of the savings that i tried to justify you in the six months building up to you buying it now we're starting to see a model where it's actually i'm committed if i don't save you money I don't earn any money. So I think start to look for those kind of models as well in the cloud, because I think that's that incentivizes both the, the procurer and the seller of, along a common goal. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a very cool, very unique, and I think very appealing um, pricing and procurement, procurement model there with Spot. So definitely something that yeah. I think everyone should learn more about. Um, what about you know the topic of this event was around evolved cloud strategy they're asking uh, can you share any success stories related to uh, engaging an evolved cloud strategy yeah absolutely so um and, and maybe that's that's something i think there's some references on here um and so yeah we we can definitely share that i don't sort of have some some details to hand um but but yeah a lot we have the, quite a lot of customer references on our website feel free to reach out to us and we can share some of those with you as well um you know i i think one of the things that we're also very proud of is that you know we the term eat your own dog food is probably not the right term um but i, I like to look at our own operations and say actually i think we're a very good example of a company that's built our own kind of multi-cloud environment using a lot of the kind of the technologies and the approaches that we've been talking about. Um, but yeah, depending on uh, if people would like to uh, like us to follow up with them, we'd be very happy to share more details around, you know, where we've done this with, with different customers, but um, it's, it's a lot of them. And I think interestingly enough, a lot of them were accidental multi-cloud and we've really sort of helped them kind of retro fit a lot of the the things that we've been talking about i like that yeah always love to hear success stories it's good to hear that you uh, drink your own champagne is another one i've heard uh, that i like yeah, yeah, um, i prefer that one yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see another good question here you know, what hyperscalers can i deploy netapp cloud solutions into yeah so um so we we're amazon microsoft and google obviously the three big ones. Um, we have, so the storage services, the storage and data services, the compute, the application optimization services available consistently across all of those. Um, to some degree, IBM Cloud as well. Um, it's actually our technology that powers IBM Cloud, our storage and data technology. Um, and so, so definitely, you know, the major ones um, all covered. Um, and, I, and I noticed somebody else asked a question which is kind of related and it's just there on my screen that says, can we manage all cloud providers in a single pane of glass? Hmm. So just to, to pick up on that, you can manage all of the kind of capabilities I've been describing. So all of the storage and data services, all of the application optimization, all of those kind of capabilities, yes. You can have a single pane of glass that allows you to deal with all of those things across all of the different major hyperscalers, so Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. Excellent. And then well, there was a question as well about uh, migration. How easy is it to move data from on-prem uh, up into the cloud with NetApp? So I think we make it really simple. I mean, like I say, we're a native first-party service. If that's, we actually do third-party or first-party in the cloud providers. It's incredibly simple um, because we're there. We're part of their consoles. We're part of their tooling. Um, so it's incredibly easy to set things up. In terms of getting data into the cloud, again, we have tools for that. We have synchronization, we have replication tools. So we can, and those kind of tools that we have, if it's NetApp technology to NetApp in the cloud, then we're incredibly efficient. Um, but we also have tools that can enable us to take data from any source to any cloud destination. So it doesn't, don't think, well, we don't work with NetApp, so they can't help. That's not the case. We, in many cases, we have customers using our tools where we are neither the, des the source nor the destination, mm. but we are the broker that's helping synchronize data between the source and the destination. Oh, that's good to know. I bet a lot of folks didn't know about that. I know I didn't. So very cool. Thanks for bringing that up, that, um, that migration can be so easy with NetApp 
and NetApp doesn't yeah. even have to be the source or destination. <laughs> My sales guys won't be very happy with me saying that, but that's that's the reality. <laughs> Um, and then, I mean, we've all heard about like the 80-20 rule. Um, when it comes to use cases, what what are kind of the most popular, the top 20% of use cases for NetApp in the cloud? So, so I think we're, we're seeing, it's, it's pretty diverse. Um, you know, I think people looking at kind of the hybrid cloud approach, I think being able to back up data to the cloud, to tier data to the cloud, um, maybe to replicate data, to do test development, disaster recovery, you know, there's a whole kind of mix that fit into that kind of that hybrid cloud um, element of it. I think in terms of where are we seeing people kind of looking at single or multiple clouds and, and using our technology behind it, then I think it's it's a lot more for the sort of the enterprise applications. So we're seeing uh, a big update uptake, of course, in VMware cloud, um, sorry, VMware across the different cloud providers. Um, SAP, you know, as an example, with the reference architecture within Microsoft Azure and Google Cloud Platform, the reference architecture for SAP has NetApp storage and data management capabilities at its heart. So it's um, it's a real, real mix of um, of everything from very, very high performance enterprise workloads through to some of the more kind of augmented kind of hybrid type capabilities as well. Excellent. Yeah, sounds like a lot of different well, use can, cases. And I should, mm -hmm. and I should actually one of the one of the I should call out specifically is container services. Um, we're starting to see a massive uptake in companies rather than lift and shift, looking at that kind of rearchitecting to be able to use containers in the cloud. Um, and we have a way of very simple way of presenting our storage persistently up into these containerized environments. And we're seeing a shift of people moving away from um, stateless containerized services to stateful containerized services. And as that's happening, it's creating a demand for persistent storage. So again, that, that I would pick out as a, as a significant growing workload as well. Excellent. All right. Well, I'm afraid we're running out of time here in our webinar hour. And um, we, there's so many great questions. We could keep going on this for a long time. But a final question I want to make sure I ask you, Matt, before you go is, uh, where should folks go to learn more about NetApp and, you know, especially if they're on this cloud journey to, to hybrid multi-cloud, we've got some resources there on the screen, but what do you recommend? Yeah. Yeah. So um, definitely go to netapp.com. Um, there's some, some great resources there. Um, we have a, a phenomenal partner community um, of which I'm sure a lot of these people will already be working with partners that are, that are also partners of ours as well. So do reach out to them. Um, and yeah, um, you know, so that so that that would be would be my suggestions, and of course, click the links on the the, the slides here. That'll that'll help you engage as well. Excellent. Well, I learned a lot. I know the audience did as well. Uh, Matt, it's been a pleasure having you on the webinar today. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, David. Thank you. And of course, thank you to our friends over at NetApp for supporting us on the webinar today. Uh, don't forget about the resources there on the screen. Those are clickable links. There's a QR code, there's resources in the handouts tab, three different PDFs you can download with the click of a mouse right now before you go. Um, and with that, I am now um, prompted to respond or to announce the winner of our Amazon $300 gift card. This is going to Warren Maruco from California. Congratulations, Warren Maruco from California. We'll also be reaching out to our best question prize winner. I hope that you uh, learned a lot on the event today. We'll see you next time. Uh, visit netapp.com for more information. Take care. Bye-bye.